It's the recap, UFC Vegas, Fight Night 37. God damn it, Tony Gravely. Tony Gravely, why? Anyways, we're going to have to get through this. Tony Gravely. We're going to get through this, of course, like we always do. 14 fights to choose from. Top ticket did hit, so not the end of the world, but the what ifs. The what ifs. The two more seconds. Anyways, we're not going to start there. We're going to start right at the bottom. I know I tend to ramble on these, and YouTube, for whatever reason, cut me off after an hour the last time. So I'm going to set a timer. And we're going under an hour. 14 fights, so let's jump right into things. Hannah Goldie, Emily Whitmire, right off the top. Had a bunch of people messaging me saying Emily Shitmire. And although hilarious, we had to see how this one plays out. And uh, 100%, they were right. You were right. You messaged me, Emily Shitmire, right on. You got this one right. You would think someone gets armbarred from guard, and then that's something you got to go back in the gym and improve on. I mean, BJJ is... You just don't see arm bars from guard, right? In men's MMA, you never see it, right? There has to be some type of positional setup. A lot of guys like to set it up on top, right? Even if you're going to set it up on bottom, you know, you latch onto this thing. It, you got to create a scramble, go belly down. Very few fighters just allow themselves to get caught by it. When she's been caught before, two fights back against Pollyanna Viana, you would think it would just go back to the drawing board and learn how to defend the arm bar from guard. At the very least, improve your overall skill set. And I think that's one key issue with Emily Whitmire is that she appears to have not improved her skill set whatsoever. Every fight we assume there's going to be improvements. I, I am particularly bad for this. I assume there's going to be some improvements, largely because she's full-time at Extreme Couture. She's got a great coaching staff. She's in the gym full-time. She's, you would, she's gaining experience in the UFC. But no, it just does not translate. This is now a three-fight losing streak for her. I would say she's officially released from the promotion. She's, uh, I believe, now four and five overall as a professional. And yeah, it's just, it, it, it's it's a bad look. You've been submitted all three times. And there is a word coming out that Emily Whitmire is one of these fighters that's just not very mentally strong, right? She had a good start to this fight. She went out, she landed a couple decent strikes. She's got the two takedowns, you know, was able to chuck Hannah Goldie to the mat. And they were both moving up to 125, but Hannah Goldie's ripped up. Like, she's in great shape. She's very strong. But it did appear that Emily Whitmire might have been the stronger fighter. She was winning the round. Unfortunately, Goldie did an excellent job of just keeping throwing up these submissions, and eventually one was one of them was going to stick, and it did. Armbar from guard. You know, lose to start the night, right, because we ended up taking Emily Whitmire. How embarrassing is that? But so low on the level of importance that not not the end of the world. Moving on, we got Gustavo Lopez, highly Alatang. Alatang was like everybody's baby this week. Uh, a lot of money was coming in on him. A lot of people were backing him. I decided to go the other way and go, go Gustavo Lopez. The reasoning, the reasoning is Gustavo Lopez, better striker, better volume standing, be able to outstrike him standing. Haile Alatang was going to have the forward pressure and mix in some takedown attempts. And it actually being like polar opposite. It was still a 50-50 fight. It was still a who you got fight. And the fact that it was ruled a draw, even though you can make an argument that Gustavo Lopez could have won, a draw, it was a close competitive fight. So I don't think anybody should be overly upset about that. But Gustavo was just wasn't throwing his hands in the first round. I mean, the first two rounds in particular, just super hesitant, not letting his hands go. And I thought he did have the striking advantage, yet it was Alatang that appeared to be having, uh, you know, more success. But again, he wasn't throwing shit either. And that's the knock on him. That's the knock going in. And all of his fights is that there's no volume out of him. So the first two rounds are close. Like Again, I think there's an argument that I, I personally thought, thought that Alatang won the first round. Gustavo Lopez might edge at the second. You could flip that theory. You can score the first two rounds for Gustavo. You could score the first two rounds for Haile. But it seemed like consensus was it was 2 nothing Haile Alatang going into the third and that Gustavo Lopez would need a finish. And, uh, yeah, good thing he didn't get a finish. He didn't get a 10-8 round, but he did get a 10-8 round. He legitimately had his best round in the third. I mean, he had more pressure, more volume, was shooting the takedowns. And, again, this goes back to... We were kind of we were on the right side of things, I suppose. When Gustavo Lopez was a draw, nobody was on the right side of anything. But you know, I didn't feel bad about the, the Lopez pick. It's just I really thought striking was going to be his avenue, and that he wasn't going to have no success with his wrestling. Third round, he showed he could get this fight to the ground. Unfortunately, that cage is there. Haile Alatang kept grabbing that cage, preventing the takedowns. Loses a point. It's still, Gustavo Lopez's round. He's got the 10-8 round. This could be an at worst case scenario, a draw. Best case scenario, it's a Lopez win. Unfortunately, they go with the worst case scenario, and that results in the draw. So no money exchange, no money loss. And because Shitmeyer already blew the Gustavo Lopez ticket, it really didn't matter. But effectively, we're 0-1-1 one one to start out the night. Carlson Harris versus Ipica Sanganai. We backed the dog here in Carlson Harris. 
Impic and Sanganice is dropping down to 170 pounds. Physically looks great. You know, he's full time at Sanford MMA now. That's all great stuff. But against Sasha Palotnikov, again, volume wasn't there. His striking looks pretty hesitant. Like he's not overly sure of himself. And as far as his choking out Sasha Palotnikov, he's not going to come out here and choke out Carlson Harris, right? The grappling advantage is Harris. The striking advantage, unknown. I say unknown because Carlson Harris definitely has a lot more power. He has nice boxing. <clears throat> but I don't know. Maybe it felt like Impa could have been a just as good of a striker. That's why the line was fairly close. And yeah, Impa was having moments, but they were both chucking bombs. And the problem with when you're chucking bombs with Carlson Harris is that he has a lot of power. <clears throat> they said in his like pre-fight story, you know, like comes from Guyana, comes over to Brazil and, you know, picks up boxing as a hobby. And these people in the small little gym are just like, holy shit, like this guy hits. This guy's all right. And they encourage him to like, go to Rio because Rio's got the best gyms if you want to stay in Brazil. So he goes to Rio and now he trains with some of the best boxers there. D did his boxing look fundamentally, Chris? Maybe not, but he's going to get away with a couple things. He's got long arms on him and he's got cracking big power. So personally, I thought he'd use that right hand to back up Impa and then successfully take him down at some point and use his submission game. Didn't matter. He caught him with the right hand and put him down. You can argue that it was potentially an early stoppage. I know Impa definitely argued it was an early stoppage. And Mark Smith's a shit referee, so could have been an early stoppage. But as much as I like to shit on Mark Smith, worst referee in the game, by the way, I would have loved to have him in that goddamn Tony Gravely fight. Anyways, so we're 1-1-1. One, one, and one. We hit an underdog here in Carlson Harris. We're moving on, and now we're extremely invested. We got Aaron Blanchfield versus Sarah Alpar. Aaron Blanchfield was like a minus 380 favorite, but she's parlay material, and considering the other parlay material, or one of them was 8-1 to one, and one of, them, one of them was minus 650, this is at least getting us uh, some type of value in conjunction with the rest of those two taking on Sarah Alpar. I guess the only knock pre-fight that you can make on Blanchfield is that she is super young, right? Outside of that, it looks like she's got a legitimate skill set. She's improving everywhere. She has a large grappling advantage in this fight. Back when she was 18 years old, she'd be considered to have a large grappling advantage in this fight. What she didn't have is the wrestling and the striking as a young fighter. Now that she's developing, you do see fight to fight, adding in all these wrinkles, and it looks pretty good. And against Sarah Alpar, it was a tough task to begin with. She's obviously got a, a wrestling advantage because she has some decent wrestling, but she's not able to put it to use at the highest level. And to be honest, this is not a wrestling match. It's a mixed martial arts match. Even had she successfully taken down Blanchfield, she was still going to be getting out grappled. And Blanchfield's just improving so rapidly that, yeah, her wrestling looked bad. It was just a beatdown from pillar to pose. First round's a 10-9. Second round's a 10-8. Third round, you can make an argument, it's a 10-8. Beat down, pillar to post. The one thing is, and I did mention this to Paul Shaughnessy, uh, um, Pookie Beat, sorry, uh, Dogger Pass pre week. Sarah Alpar's tough, man. She's a fighter. She'll take that beating. She's not looking to quit. She fought out of every submission attempt. When she would get ground and pounded, she would try to improve position the best she could. And she lasted a decision. I'll give her kudos there, but she's extremely limited. And I just don't know where she fits in the UFC. Montel Jackson versus JP Buys. Okay, so we just went from a top ticket play in Blanchfield. Happy with that one. We're rolling into a top ticket player here in Montel Jackson. And Montel Jackson's a minus 650, right? Blanchfield, she looked like a minus 10,000 favorite, right? She rolled so easy. Hopefully Jackson rolls easy as well. This wasn't as easy as one would like to imagine. Now, I'm more of a prop guy. Or sorry, I'm more of a parlay guy than a prop guy. And I know the prop guys would have been very, very frustrated because they. how could you not be frustrated if you have a Montel Jackson inside the distance ticket? Very few people would have taken him by decision. Uh, you, you chase that inside the distance, and he had plenty of moments. But this was a greasy fight all around. So J.P. Buys is up on short notice. He's taking the fight at 135 pounds, up a weight class. None of this results in him finding any success. He's just been knocked out by Bruno Silva. He has another knockout loss previous in his career. Doesn't have a great chin. Stacks, cards are stacked against him, right? He scores a takedown on Montel Jackson early in the, fr in the fight. It's like, okay, you know, everyone kept saying about how good this kid's wrestling was, and he showed none of it against Bruno Silva. A scoring a takedown on Montel Jackson, not a wrestler, but all the same, right? Pretty decent, right? And he's up a weight class. He's taking on a big 35er. Scores the takedown. From the takedown, takes it back, fishes a rear naked choke. I'm sweating. How could you not be? We have a minus 650 favorite. He's a top ticket guy. We're all over him. And he's just been taken down by a smaller man, gives up his back, who's fishing for a rear naked choke. But Montel's got these real strong hands, right? Everybody was talks about strong hands, so grip strength. And whenever he wanted, he just kind of – his chin wasn't even buried at one point, but he was able to just hand fight and always have the advantage, right, because he's got them strong hands. Once he eventually gets up, uh, 
it's like, okay, Montel Jackson all day. And he starts to piece him up, knees to the body, right? Landing his hands, good strikes all around. And then you got JP Buys fishing for this guillotine joke. And again, he's got a bite on this guillotine. But Montel could just hand fight, right? You can just grasp. And not trust me, I've been in a ton of guillotine jokes, right? The guy's got a hell of a grip on you. It's like you're not going anywhere. Sometimes they've got a good bite on it, but they're tired. And then they're just not that strong. And you're just able to kind of get your hand in there and like hand fight. This guy probably fresh is going to do a good job of just peeling that hand off, peeling that hand off. And once he escapes that guillotine choke, he lands a couple of good shots, round ends. So interesting. I'd like to know if you want to shoot in the comment section, but how do you score around like that? So Montel Jackson landed the better strikes, but in two senses, he was in these deep submission attempts. How deep were they? And an average fighter, yeah, these are deep, you know? That rear naked choke looked pretty decent. That guillotine choke, he had a really deep bite on it. But with Jackson, was he ever panicked? Was he ever really in trouble? So does holding on to somebody's neck for 45 seconds to a minute take away from takedowns? Take away, oh, I guess he had a takedown as well. Does that take away from, like, the significant punches? This is a fight you're landing on somebody? I had a trouble, trouble to land that. But when I score a fight and I got big money on a guy or I've got money on a, any type of investment, I usually look at it like, what's my worst case scenario? And in this case, I will admit, I kind of thought, geez, my worst case scenario is that JP Buys actually won that first round. So that's kind of how I thought it might have went down. Later, looking back at the cards, two of the judges scored it for Jackson. One of them gave it for JP Buys. So it wouldn't have mattered. Second round, Jackson just comes out and he drops him right off the get-go. And I think, okay, there's the inside the distance prop right there, which I did have a little bit of shares of myself. Um, there it is. But when you, whenever Montel Jackson would drop him, he would follow him to the ground. JP Buys would basically just like recover his wits really quick. Montel Jackson would try to step, step over like half guard. And then from half guard, JP would just like roll to that Kimura on like his right arm in particular. So he's not trying to submit him with this Kimura. All he's trying to do is hold that right arm in place so that Jackson can't just smash him with it. Because now Jackson's got his right arm uh, wrapped up. His left arm's going to be on the far side. Can't land anything on the far side, right? He's just wrapped up. And so the fight would then get back standing. Montel Jackson would hit him twice. He would fall over again. And then Montel Jackson would just follow him to the ground. And he would just go back to the same position. So it was frustrating to watch. You feel like if the fight just stayed standing, eventually the, the ref would have just mercy killed it and been like, dude, you've been dropped six times. Like, just drop him. And remember Mark Hunt? You know, OG fans know Mark Hunt. Some of the newer fans might not remember him. he just blast the guy and turn around and walk away of his kickboxing route and sometimes the ref would just stop and look and just wave it off montel could have done that but he'd pursue him to the ground it would cause jp to fight for his life in fighting for his life he just goes to a neutral defensive position to try to regain his wits and it would just kill time off the clock so montel jackson scores four knockdowns in this fight they said it was a bantamweight record the previous record was three he goes and he eclipses that and yet still doesn't walk away with a finished victory. So if, if you're Montel Jackson, you're his supporters are in the UFC, it is a win and it is an impressive win. He looked good, but you're a minus 650 favorite over a guy coming up a weight class, fighting on short notice, and been knocked out by a 25er in his last fight, not known for his durability. Maybe it takes a little bit of the shine that you went to decision with him. It might take a little bit of the shine. And if you JP buys, you definitely give him another fight. Definitely give him another fight. Because one, he should be at 25. I think we know that by now. The wrestling did look good in that one little spurt. His cardio looked on point. Every time he'd get dropped, he'd get up. And he'd try to make something happen. The problem was he couldn't make anything happen because he wasn't a good striker. And he's taking on Montel Jackson. But he was swinging. He was throwing some leg kicks. He had some bounce to him. And then he'd get hit and he'd floor it over. His problem is his chin. And it doesn't matter. UFC, I think they should give him another fight back at 25. It doesn't matter who he fights. He's athletic. He's got some talent. He's got some great wrestling. But he's fucking chinny. And that's going to be a problem for him for the rest of his career, I believe. So there's always going to be a, a buyer. Even though he just lasted a decision. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. There's going to be a problem there going forward. And, and think about the damage he just incurred, even though he didn't get knocked out. Zuron versus Brendan Jenkins. Zuron is another one of these Aaron Blanchfields. He's super young. The difference is Blanchfield hasn't shit in a pie already, so there's like more confidence in her. She seems to be going in the right direction, whereas Zuron just looked awful against Kazula Vargas in his debut. On tape in China, this kid looks like he's got the goods, you know? He's already got 20 professional fights, and he was 20 years old. I mean, it's pretty crazy. Debuts in the UFC, a lot of fanfare. But it's just like, man, he's too young and he gets a lot of these finishes. So against Vargas, he's just gun shy. He just stood there, stared right at him, didn't let his offense go, didn't look comfortable. 
Even when Vargas starts slowing in the third round, the kid looked really hesitant, drops the fight, bad performance. And as a result, there's like a there's like a universal fade here going on for Zhu Rong. So initially people are looking to fade him. He gets a short known as replacement in Brandon Jenkins. And, and and people don't seem to care. People don't seem to care. They're still like, you know what? It's an auto fade. So they're in on Brandon Jenkins. Now, I got Zhu Rong. The issue is, is that he was a three to one favorite. That's what they opened up this Jenkins line at. And uh, it did seem a it did seem a tad bit a little heavy, right? He did shit in the bed big time against Vargas one fight prior. He's still only 21 years old, but he he left the UFC performances due in China and went down to American Top Team. And I don't know if that was a key difference for a sophomore outing, if it wasn't some big crowd or, you know, just more experience. But he looked like a million bucks, man. He looked as good as a 21-year-old MMA fighter could ever look, you know, in this spot. Like, he, he did... Awesome. He looked tremendous. Went out there, did exactly what he needed to do. His striking looked solid. Jenkins is one of these guys that call him, you know, the human highlight reel for a reason. He just throws a lot of, you know, spinning back fists and flying knees and spinning elbows and just very awkward, hard time techniques. But Zhu Rong just chewed him up standing. He chewed him up. If Jenkins didn't have a cast iron chin on him, this thing's done in the first round. The fact that he does have a cast iron chin on him allows him to get some rounds. Now, I had the Zhu Rong over one and a half, and we got the Zhu Rong Jenkins over two and a half. So the props that we officially went with, yeah, so we've got, I think it's a minus 155 on the over one and a half, and a minus, and it was a plus 155 on the over two and a half. I just want to bring it up. Freaking, you think I'd have already this preset, right? Especially because I'm on a running timer. What time are we at right now? <clears throat> uh, I guess it doesn't matter. Anyways, we were the over one and a half, the over two and a half. We got plus money in the over two and a half. It was like plus 155. And I'll tell you straight up, the only reason we went with that and we didn't take a zoo wrong by decision and we didn't take a fight goes the distance is looking back at Brandon Jenkins. His pro losses are uh, Nick Compton by decision. This Tweedy was a submission, whatever. That was six years ago. Carson Frey decision. Damian Hill decision. Jeff Peterson split decision. Robert Watley decision. Mike Breeden flying knee third round. <clears throat> third round gets caught with a flying knee. So he looked to have a good chin on him, but boy, oh boy, did he have to put it on display. Zhu Rong absolutely tested it. And again, I think he looked very, very good. Got the takedowns when he needed to, got a stoppage with 25 seconds left. And that's kind of the difference between a guy like Zhu Rong and a guy like Montel Jackson, right? Zhu Rong's got this guy hurt. He's working him over. And when he gets this guy on the ground, he's relentless and he's punching and he's going for it. And your corner would tell you there's a minute left or there's 30 seconds left. In this case, there's 25 seconds left. And you just keep punching and you go for it and you win. And the UFC says, damn, we like this guy. And they're excited to set you up for a bigger fight next time out. Montel Jackson didn't do that. He sat with his fucking arm in a rinky dink Kimura and complained to the ref, his fingers are in my gloves, which they probably were, but. You, good. This is good stuff from Zhu Rong. I hope that they just keep matching him up soft because he's so young, but he looked like he could be a legitimate prospect. And it can, if he continues to stay stateside and train with the best guys in the world and doesn't end up with one of these, he's just shop worn by the time he's 25. I'm excited for this kid a lot. Raquel Pennington versus Penny Kianzad. This fight, honestly, in my opinion, could have gone either way. It seems like everybody was saying Raquel Pennington, but first round Penny Kianzad, she outstrikes her. She lands a better volume. I think. I think most people universally agree that it's Penny Kian's at first round. Second round, Raquel Pennington does exactly what we knew she'd be capable of doing. She just makes it rugged. You know, she's got a very, like, Lauren Murphy-esque style. I guess Lauren Murphy has a Raquel Pennington-esque style. You know, Raquel's kind of the OG of doing it, but just backs you up and brawls with you, and it does not work at the highest level, right? She has not proven to beat an Amanda Nunez or uh, Jermaine Durand. I mean, that's okay. That's okay. But mid-level or low-tier high-level – yeah, it works. It works very well. And Raquel Pennington uses it extremely effectively. She just made this a brawl and a grind against the fence. So third round, I'm assuming it's going to be Pennington. Maybe it's body language, right? It looks like Pennington's still crashing forward. It looks like Penny's tired. Raquel's letting her hands go. But Penny's landing the better shots. Like, her shots are landing clean, just not doing anything because Raquel's so fucking tough. But she's landing good combinations. She's landing good shots. Raquel, meanwhile, just takes them and bulldozes forwards and wings a couple shots. And listen, forward pressure, body language, willingness to scrap, and showing zero respect for anything that your opponent hits you with, uh, that looks good to the judges. Like, if you snap a guy's head back, even if it's just on a jab, you say, like, oh, and you only snap his head back, right? If you maul a guy with just, like, a vicious right hook, 
even if you head kick this guy, right? And he just like, and he, and he comes forward. It's like, oh, wow, well, it didn't really hurt him. It's all about perception. And I guess the perception was Raquel was walking her down and beating her up. Maybe I just didn't really think about this fight or pay close enough attention, but I think it could have gone either way. I think it was a 50-50 fight. Unfortunately, we went with Panny Kienzad, so it's a loss for us as far as official picks go. But it was uh, it was lower on just because we just thought it could go either way and uh, didn't want the, the most faith in Panny Kienzad. Going on to the next fight, Tafan and Jaqui, Mike Rodriguez, same thing, same thing, right? I, we did go with Mike Rodriguez, but it was just low on the priority list. It was hard to get faith there. I guess the real reasoning here was Tafan's moving back up to 205, and God damn, this guy's slow. Like everything he slow, fight and throws – is slow, slow leg kick, slow right hand, slow movement, kind of stiff and robotic. Just there for the jab all day. And Mike Rodriguez, six foot four, slow Mike, big reach on him. You know, he's gonna probably be able to pop out the jab. He's probably gonna be able to keep him at bay with the kicks. Not the case. Defon looked awesome, awesome by his own standards, right? I don't think awesome is in this guy's breaking into the top ten of the fifteen just yet, <clears throat> and he's a little bit older, so we'll see what his ceiling really is. But awesome in the sense that he moved back to 205, and maybe it's better weight cut, maybe it's more energy. He did look a lot faster. His footwork did look much improved. His volume was much improved. And when he would ding Rodriguez with these combinations, these big hooks side to side, it's like, that's some heavy pressure. Rodriguez never got comfortable once. Not once. Got taken down at the end of the first round. You know, had trouble from, from the bottom. Was losing the striking anyways. The second and third round, he'd get a little bit of momentum going. His corner would like it. They'd be like, step in with the elbow, step in with the elbow. He'd step in, he'd crack with something, and it didn't matter. Tafon just ate it and kept moving forward, like Raquel Pennington, only he he made it much more definitive. You know, he was just bombing on him. And every time he did, Rodriguez had nothing and nowhere to go. It's a tough setback for Rodriguez, who's just, he's got a lot of bad luck in the UFC. This was not necessarily bad luck. He was just the lesser skilled man, and he was fighting in a small cage, and Tafon looked awesome. But, you know, the Ed Herman fight could have been his, and it wasn't. The Daniil Marquez fight, he got smothered up, and now a loss to Tafon and Jaqui. He's on a three-fight losing streak. I would like to see the UFC bring him back one more time and give him a pure striker, but they, they just did. They just did. They just gave him a fight against a pure striker where he should have shown off his striking acumen, and no one there. And as they mentioned, I think he's been taken down 23 times in the UFC, and he's never scored a takedown, so he's got, like, the worst He's got like the worst wrestling on paper in the division, right? So we, we know that wrestlers will eat him up all day, so you got to match him up with these strikers, and strikers are going to eat him up all, all, up all day. Dong Jung knocked him out in, like, a minute, and in this case, Tafan and Jaquie was supposed to be slow, and he's coming up a weight class. <clears throat> it didn't matter how slow he was, right? He still beat him up, so... A tough go all around for Slow Mike. You could see him getting released as well. And Tafan, very solid win, gets back in the win column. He'll be able to have a couple fun fights moving forward. Joaquin Buckley versus Antonio Arroyo. So this one, I'll admit, I might have been high. I might not paying attention. I might have had Bellator on in the background. But I thought Antonio Arroyo won the first two rounds. Uh, looking at the numbers this morning, Buckley outlanded him 15 to 6 in the first round. Like, what was I missing? And to me, it seemed in the first round like Arroyo was throwing those head kicks. He did hit him. He did hurt him to a certain extent. But Buckley wasn't really landing a whole lot, you know? He had a snap left high kick. Snappy left high kick. Arroyo would block it. Arroyo seemed to be, you know, handling the distance management a lot better and is landing the better strikes. I had the first round score to Arroyo. Even though I'm on Buckley, we got Buckley on that three-line ticket with Zhu Rong. Love me some Joaquin Buckley here. But again, in my mind, I think worst case scenario when I'm invested in somebody, and I, I thought he lost the first round. Second round, according to the numbers, Joaquin Buckley actually outstrikes him again, 12 to 10. I thought that round was a lot closer. I thought Buckley had a lot better success in that round. But for whatever reason, I, I actually did score it for Antonio Arroyo as well. I had Antonio Arroyo up two rounds going into the third. And then in the third, see, here's the thing with Antonio Arroyo is that he's got questionable cardio, and it's just the way it is. You see how big he is? Big compared to his opponent, Joaquin Buckley, sure, but big in general, dude. This guy is a massive middleweight. His last fighting is Duran Wynn. He's at a catch weight of 195 because he couldn't make the weight on short notice, showing you how big he is. And even at a catch weight of 195, he gassed out after the first three, four minutes. So in this fight, he fought a good two rounds. You know, he fought a good first round. He started to slow down a little bit in the second. Man, he, I, in my opinion, anyways, he could have won the second. This could be a 2 nothing Royal situation. But in the third, man, he's tired. And his hands are always low. But in this case, his, his reflexes are slowing down because he's tired. So he doesn't have the ability to jump backwards or throw the hands up or evade damage. And so Buckley just catches him clean. And one thing we know about Buckley, he got a lot of power. 
So when he does, he pounces on him. He does exactly what he has to do. He gets the TKO victory, moves us forward, pumped up. And I looked at this one like, oh, good bounce, you know. I thought maybe if this goes to decision, I could be losing and I get that third round finish. That's a comeback. Good for you, Buckley. That's coming overcoming adversity. Now I just need my boy Nate, uh, Tony Gravely to come out here and do his thing. And we're gonna we're gonna be good. We're gonna be good. We're gonna be fine. We got him on uh, the second tier ticket, so he's a pivotal part of this entire lineup. And I, I like Tony Gravely. I like what he brings to the table. I like his boxing in the pocket. I like his forward pressure. I like his wrestling. You know, two time all Amer or two time state champion out of Virginia, now full time of American Top Team, training with some of the best guys going. Nate Maness, meanwhile, and again, this is something that we talked about extensively in the preview show. And I should have taken my own goddamn advice. Nate Maness always screws me. Always. Don't know why. <laughs> he's my kryptonite man he really is this is now the third time so it's not like you know i don't got a, a reverse vince pichelle like paul shaughnessy got right but uh yeah no i i, I nate maness finds a way to screw me and in his first fight against muñoz i thought he lost the judges gave it to him in the second fight against sanders he's getting beat up the first three four minutes but he comes back he takes sanders his best shots and lands that counter right when he lands his punches he does a lot of damage he's heavy-handed once he gets Sanders' respect, Sanders starts to try to shoot some wrestling, and now he, he's, he Nate's all over him. Nate gets the finish. Cost me on the Sanders fight. Okay, but Sanders, though, it's another one of these guys just get bad reads on. Tony Gravely, don't let me down. This is where MMA is a, as a – it's just like any other sport that you're betting, right? You could be up – you could be up 6 nothing in a baseball game, bottom of the eighth, you're looking good, and all of a sudden the team comes back. You could have the – over under and you're looking good and then the fourth quarter of a football game you know they, they put up 30 points like there's always these bad beats that can happen on a whim your read could be great you were on the over under and you were totally right until i don't know two of the three cornerbacks all got injured in some you know stretch of unfortunate events and now nobody's able to cover these wide receivers like anything can happen in the Gravely situation, yeah, that was just it's a bad bounce, man. It's a bad bounce. In the first round, he's moving forward. He's definitely backing up Nate Maness just like we thought we would do. He's got the faster hands. The problem is, is that he never moves his head all that much when he steps in and throws combinations. And he loves to throw his combinations. And even the commentary team are like, sometimes as a wrestler, you fall in love a little bit with the hands because you score these big knockouts. And it did feel like Gravely wanted to specifically mix it up with his hands. But I, I won't discredit him. He did try to work in the wrestling numerous times. Problem is he couldn't get Nate Maness down. Maness is big, dude. Nate's a big boy for this weight class. And as, whereas his wrestling's okay, his okay wrestling mixed in with his size, he stuffed out Gravely's attempts on every every time. So it caused Gravely to have to brawl. I thought Nate was winning the first round until maybe, you know, 20 seconds left. When, you know, Gravely starts to have some moments. Gravely starts to back him up. And then 10-second clapper. And I'm thinking, Gravely's just going to rush in blind, I think. You could see it in him. You could see he wanted to do something to end the round. And when the 10-second clapper went, he's just bouncing, bouncing. He just steps in with a hell of a right hand. Boom. Blast Nate. Nate drops. There's probably four seconds left. Nate's out when he drops. You can watch this thing on slow motion. He gets smoked. He drops. Sack of potatoes. Hits the ground. His back hits the cage. And he eats like another short shot to the top of the head as he's sitting down and it half wakes him up. And all it does is just hits him, causes him to regain some type of sense. And he just curls forward where he's surely going to eat one or two more punches and this thing's getting waved off and the, and the bell rings. Now a referee should sit there and assess right away. Like, Dolly shit, dude, you just got floored. And I want you, I urge you if you can, if you have fight pass, if you have the fights, go back and watch this, right? So Nate, Nate's like curled forward. The round ends. A real referee would, even the doctor, would be like, dude, you just got dropped hard, right? Your head hits the back of the cage. You need at least one follow-up shot. You're saved by the bell. Everybody knows this is saved by the bell. Everybody knows this should be a 10-8 round. Because he was, even though he was doing some good work at that first, this is like as close as a finish as a, as a finish could get. The referee looks at him for a second and turns around, back turn to him, and just walks away. And Nate just sits on the floor like, what a shitty ref, man. You're not going to go over and check this guy? Even if, don't wave it off. I'm not I'm not complaining sour grapes say this should have been stopped. At least go check on the guy. He stands up, his corner brings him over, and they're just like, you got to bounce it out, you got to bounce it out. And he just stares at them. He can't move. There's no bounce to him. He might not even understand what the hell the guy just said to him. 
Benet Maness is a fucking warrior from Kentucky. And I'll tell you what, boy, this guy recovered in that one minute between rounds. <laughs> oh, man. He recovered between rounds, man. He came out and, like, he looked a tad bit stiff for the first 30 seconds. He ate a left hook that partially kind of caused him to wobble. And then he fully regained his senses and then gravely tried to take him down. But shit, the guy's takedown defense stood up again. And now he's got to now now he's regained his focus. And now Gravely steps in to throw these stupid blind ass in the pocket exchanges. And the longer you fight that game plan, the more you're touching fire. And whereas it almost worked in the first, it could just it could go south the same way. He gets clipped himself. He topples over. He eats a few ground and pound punches. He looked like it was a good stoppage as well. He wasn't defending himself. Head curled down. Huge comeback. I can't take anything away from Nate Maness. And what do I do? What do I do? Do I bet him next time? Probably probably loses if I bet him next time. But you also have to realize that we're we're a second. We're maybe two seconds away from not even having this discussion and just being like, sick, Tony Gravely, look legit, top 15 Bantamweight, excited to see what's from him next, guy's the limit, super talented, to, yeah, this guy's got a low ring IQ, man. And the wrestling, not that good, dude. He couldn't take Nate down at all. And, uh, yeah, his striking, he's got power, but like, he's not setting it. Now, it's an afterthought. That's Sport and life is a crazy bitch, man. It can take a quick left-hand turn. UFC 266 is coming up fast, and Drafting Sportsbook, the official sports betting partner of the UFC, has a knockout offer for this weekend's fights. DraftKings is offering new customers $150 in free bets instantly if you bet just $1 or more on any fight before the main event. That's right, bet just $1 on any fight at UFC 266, DraftKings Sportsbook will give you $150 in free bets instantly. And don't worry, if MMA isn't for you, DraftKings Sportsbook offers pretty much every other sport, football, golf, you name it, they more than likely got it. And of course, it's safe, secure, reliable, and the best part is, you can deposit and withdraw your cash whenever you want. Don't miss out on the action at UFC 266 with DraftKings Sportsbook, the official sports betting partner of the UFC. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use promo code DOP when you sign up to receive $150 in free bets instantly if you bet $1 on UFC 266. That's code DOP to receive $150 instantly only on DraftKings Sportsbook. Must be 21 years or older, New Jersey, Indiana, or Pennsylvania only, new customers only, winnings paid out on site credits. Restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com slash sportsbook for details. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or in Indiana, 1-800-9-WITH. And that's just like such a mad bummer because we come up and we got Armin Sarukian versus Christos Giagos now. And like we're all in on Sarukian, but it just feels so shittier now because <laughs> greatly menace. The highs and lows, my friends, the highs and lows. But we got Sarukian. Sarukian's a top ticket play. He's uh, parlayed with Blanchfield and Montel Jackson, so we do need him to hit. And I always say, your top ticket is your highest investment. The other stuff, we're looking for the big hit, we're looking for the big score, we're looking to turn a few dollars into a, a handful of dollars, you know, a bunch of dollars. And you want a little action on every fight on the card, even if it's small action, so you spread it out. But we really need this top ticket. Unfortunately, we had Gravely on the second ticket, and uh, it would have came together so perfectly as well. We could have hedged out because you had Smith in the main event, and then you had Zou, you had a Ru Zong, Zong Ru, whatever you want to call him. You had Rong, and you had Buckley on the third line. So it would have set us up to we're going into the main event with three tickets in play, the highest, which being a six minus a plus 650, right? All, all good stuff, and a hedge out opportunity, which you would not even have taken. A second or two cost you. It's the difference. So anyways, we're all in on Saruki, and how, how much more... Could you want from him? He looks solid. Ah, he looks solid. I guess he pulled Christos Giagos kind of on top of him. Christos Giagos ended up on top. Giagos has got some decent grappling, but kudos to Saruki. And he just got back up, you know, got back up. You see where his striking is improving a lot. A lot of people were talking about, <clears throat> he's a decision guy. He's a decision guy. He's, you know, uh, another Khabib in the sense that he's just going to take you down. Another Islam Makachev is going to take you down. He's going to grind you. He's going to hold position. He's not going to let you up. And he's going to chip away with ground and pound. He's more of a decision guy, more of a decision guy. But you can see he's still so goddamn young. He's like 24 years old. So he's making a lot of improvements, and he does have big power. And with Giagos, he's he's flimsy at times. You know, He's an excellent hammer. You watch Christos Giagos fight, and he's on top. He's shooting takedowns. He's out muscling you. He is an excellent workhorse. He's on the receiving end. He's the nail. 
he does fold up. He does get a little flimsy at times. And Surkin's a nine to one favorite. Why? Because Jaguars is not going to be able to take him down. And even though he ended up on top, it proved to be true. He couldn't hold him down. And as soon as this thing got standing, not that Armin was some great striker on paper coming in, but he was a better striker and he showed off a lot of improvements. He hurts Giagos. He puts him away. This is great because even though we just lost this Tony Gravely thing, still so frustrating. Uh, we also had the Armin Sarukian inside the distance at plus 160. So that hits, softens the blow a little bit. This also seals the top ticket for us. So we're happy. We cash that money at least. And then the rest of the card, we on the parlay side of things, we don't have a ton of investment. But, you know, Anthony Smith would have been our most confident guy that still would have been on the ticket. So if you want to reinvest on him, you could have. If not, you could have walked away. Does it matter? Bomb versus Lipsky. This is a bad move on my part. Partially, Bomb's coming off a year-long absence. She didn't look good. The, the tape that I had watched on her, she looked okay. Thought that she'd be able to come out here and maybe get this fight to the ground against Lipsky, who's just shown absolutely porous takedown defense against low-level wrestlers. I mean, when you're getting ground and pounded up by the likes of Antina Shevchenko on the ground, taken down routinely, it, it's been costing her. And she's been even finished her last number of fights as Lipsky. I thought Bond would be able to have some success taking this fight to the ground. I also thought at range, Lipsky, the violence queen, not enough volume out of her. Bomb was uh, SPG Ireland. She wouldn't throw a ton of volume herself, but she'd be able to intercept her coming in. Frustrator. Lipsky looked awesome. Bomb, Bomb looked mediocre, you know, didn't look any better than she had looked in Bellator, maybe looked even a little worse than she looked in Bellator. But all of that is because of how good Lipsky looked. Now, Lipsky doesn't look, she didn't look like a world beater. She didn't look like she's good going challenge for the for UFC title. But by her own standards, this is by far the best she's ever looked. Her takedown defense looks solid. Stopped down ever, all of Bomb's attempts. Uh, striking looked solid, crisp, clean. She was throwing. She was, uh, you know, she, she was aggressive. She was coming forward. Her cardio looked good. She had a tight de defensive stance the whole way through. This was a good performance out of her. And again, I think a lot of that can be associated to going to American Top Team. It doesn't have to be ATT. I know their name always comes up, but you need to go to a gym that has a full team of people your size and your skill level and beyond your skill level better than you. You need to get in a room where people are going to legit beat you up. They're going to have their way with you because the saying in the gym goes, it's better to get beat up in the gym than to get beat up in the cage. They go hard in the gym, you know, and you need to work with a good group of people that are going to be able to push you. When you're the lead hand in the gym, when you're the best person in your gym, you go into these sparring rounds and you always win them. You go into these grappling rounds and you're winning them. you got good takedown defense because no one in your gym can take you down. Yeah, but go out there and fight some real fighters. Take on some people that are going to take you down. Put yourself in uncomfortable situations. Lipsky's still young enough that she could develop and become better, and I think that she saw that on uh, last night, Saturday. I thought she came through. She looked good. I thought she looked a lot. She was largely improved. She's getting comfortable. It was a solid one for her. Interesting to see if she can rise from the ashes because when she signed to the UFC, huge prospect, right? KSW champion. They they dubbed her the Violence Queen. They love her over in Europe. Comes to the UFC. They give her some Boku money. They match her up against a string of high profile fighters right off the hop. No good. No good. Rebounds a little bit. Okay, let's test her out again. Give her some mid-level fighters again. No good. This Mandy bomb, it's not a good win, right? It's a confidence booster. And if she continues to make improvements, she could she could get back to at least a decent level. She could go back into the top 10 if she just continues to do the work and, uh, and make a little bit of progress. Ian Kudalaba versus Devin Clark. Love Kudalaba. How could you not? How could you not like this guy? You're a fight fan. You might not like his antics, the weigh-ins, and this guy's getting in people's faces, and it's rude, and it's disrespectful. And But but as a fight fan, how could you not like a guy that just goes for it? Goes for it so much that if he doesn't get it, uh, he tends to gas himself out and be completely exhausted, right? The theory here, though, was that Ian Kudalaba went down to American Top Team, and he was going to be in better shape. And he was leaner, all fight week. He was leaner. He posts on social media all the time. It's, it was all strength and conditioning. It was all fitness. And I told Paul in the week leading up on the, on the Dogger Pass on Wednesday, he's a five. He's usually a seven-minute guy, right? He's got five minutes, great first round. Second round, he comes out a little bit. And then by the six-and-a-half, seven-minute mark, he just conks out, and he's no good, and his opponent takes over, right? But he was looking lean, and he, was, he left Moldova. He came over to American Top Team. How could that not benefit his game? And instead of coming out wild like he always does, he came out regulated, you know? He was conserving himself a little bit. He was fighting a decent game plan. And be all that, man, this guy's skilled. Because we know he's got the power standing. Maybe not quite the technique just yet, but he's got that kind of brute power that any one shot can really hurt you. 
it's that European combat sambo background. I mean, this guy's, I should just say combat sambo background, but he's a European combat sambo champion. And coming into the UFC, it's like he's got great throws, big, strong guy. If he gets on top, he's got some nasty ground and pound. He's actually got a decent submission game. But he's so wild and reckless, he'll end up giving up position. There'll end up being a scramble. He'll get back up standing. He'll wing a couple bombs, and then he'll get tied. This is a spot against Devin Clark, you know, a collegiate wrestler who generally just grinds on opponents and kind of takes the energy right out of them. He had no success. I mean, Ian Kudalaba took him down eight times. He tossed him around. He dropped him in the first round, hurts him bad. You can second round. You know what? I thought you could have stopped this fight three times maybe. Like he was beat the first round. A 10-7 doesn't exist. If you're not going to say that's a 10-7 round, then a 10-7 round does not exist. Because he absolutely mauled him pillar to post and almost stopped him two times. Now in the second round, closer round, but still mauls him. And then at the end of the second round, the teeth are bridged in. They're busted. This guy's hurting. And his dad's like, the, the question is brought up. Should we stop this fight? And his dad says, uh, well, can, can you fight? You know, can you put your mouthpiece in? Can you fight? You know, Devin Clark says, I can fight. Okay, well, then you're a fighter. Fight. It's the mentality that you need to have. It's why a guy like me is not a fighter. It's why a guy like you is probably not a fighter as well. Uh, if my if my teeth are caved in and my jaw's broken in two places and I just gotten my ass fucking smashed up, that sounded weird. I just got my face smashed up by this crazy Moldovan guy. It would have sounded really crazy if I had not corrected myself. Then. This crazy Moldovan guy who ain't going nowhere. Yeah, I don't know. How many people are like, yeah, yeah, let's do this. Oh, yeah, oh, oh, oh. I'll do this. How many people do that? Takes a lot of heart. Takes a lot of heart that most people just won't be able to imagine. There's a house on fire and it says like, holy shit, someone's got to run in there and save someone. Devin Clark's probably running in there, you know? I'll give him props. But it wasn't getting any better for him. Yeah, Kudalaba definitely did tire out in the third round, but we're used to seeing him tire out in the second round. So this is definitely a step in the right direction. And I don't think anybody in their right mind thought Ian Kudalaba by decision. I don't even know what the odds were on that. I mean, Shum gotta be like... <laughs> Plus 750. Like, how could Ian Kudalaba win a decision over Devin Clark? Devin Clark's been lo five losses, all five inside the distance. Kudalaba, all he does is win inside the distance. No one would have thunk this. But, uh, yeah, C Clark took the beating. He really did. Took the beating and he kept coming. And for Kudalaba, this is, again, another career best performance out of him. Just like Lipsky. Went to a big gym. Put in, puts in the work. Made a lot of improvements. And interesting to see where he goes from here, for sure. He I mean, he's fought in world-class guys already, like Ankalaev, Jerry Cannonier, Glover Teixeira. He's fought in some world-class guys, come up short. But that was him, wild and raw, and, and, and training in a small training room. Imagine him a little bit older, a little more seasoned, a little more technical, big room, getting better, improvements. He could, he's going to be able to hang with those top, top 10 guys. And at the very least... You see his name on the contract, and you got to fight this guy? Oh, man. Who wants to sign the vote agreement of fight him? He just took down a wrestler eight times. He's so strong. He's got big striking. He's got big power. He's wild. He's reckless. I could beat him, but at the very least, I might be going to the hospital with the guy. Like, you know, it's not going to be easy when you take on Ian Kudalaba. And then moving on to the main event, we got Anthony Smith versus Ryan Spann. Anthony Smith... Uh, I discussed it in the show. Don't I wouldn't like betting this guy as a favorite because he's that underdog and he's that underdog that always keeps coming. But again, I think you you talk about heart, the heart of a fighter and the desire to winning, the willingness to win. Well, the one thing that's cool about Anthony Smith is a lot of the times that he's picked up these big victories, they're in fights where he is losing. He'll drop a first round, he'll drop a second round, and in the third round, he brings it on strong. Now, as far as him being chinny, not chinny at all. I mean, he went five rounds with John Jones. That means nothing. People go five rounds with John Jones all the time now, but Glover needed like a massive, you know, mauling, a criminal mauling to put this guy away in a, in the fifth round of a fight. And Thiago Santos hit him in the body. Those are the only two times he's been finished by strikes in the last 11 years, 10 years. So not Chinny. Even if Ryan Spann puts it on him in this first round, he's going to be able to persevere. And Ryan Spann's got questionable cardio. He's not able to fight beyond the second round. And whereas Kudalaba impressed me and Lipsky impressed me. And a lot of these people have shored up their gas tanks. I, Spans, I don't know. He's a big boy. He's a 205, right? He's 6'4", I believe. 6'5". I think he's 6'5". You know, his cardio is probably not going to get marginally better. Anthony Smith just needs to get out of this first round and then second, third, fourth, fifth. It should be Smith all day. 
it was Smith right from the get-go. This was a clean performance. This was a clean kill, clean scalp. Uh, Smith did whatever he wanted. He drops him with the striking. His ground game was far superior. His cardio was far superior. He was confident. Smith's on a legitimate role right now. I think when he lost to Jones, a fight that no one thought he should have got in the first place, he was just kind of like that guy that was there. He's like, yeah, this guy's not that legit. Glover, Paul and I fucking cash huge on Glover because Anthony Smith was a minus 225 favorite, you know, cash big. Then he loses to Rakic. His days of being a leader are over. They bring him onto the ESPN desk, right? He does the Fox panel. He does he, he does a lot of commentating for the UFC. He's actually really smart for a guy. Uh, this is no discredit, but like for a guy with fifty pro fights, like I'm not I'm not calling fighters puncher. I'm not saying anything like that. I'm just saying for a guy with fifty pro fights, very well spoken. You know, very smart guy, very uh, a good broadcaster. So I'm thinking his days as an elite level fighter are likely over. He's got a nice cushy desk job. He's fought for a title, come up short. He's on a two fight losing streak. He's not necessarily too old but with 50 pro fights his body's got to be shutting down those are all just like assumptions you would make on a guy couldn't be farther for the truth in the case of anthony smith and that's why somebody along the way looked at this kid and nicknamed him lionheart because that's what he's got he's completely reinvented himself a submission went over devin clark oh well dude it's devin clark he always gets finished it's a triangle whatever a win over jimmy crute ah, jimmy crute's only 24 years old it was a leg injury it was a leg injury you can't, you can't deny this guy. He physically looks in excellent shape. Factory X Muay Thai has got him on point. His striking is still improving. His jab's legit. His low kick's legit. He's got good power. His submission game, very underrated. He takes your back. He gets that rear naked choke more often than not. He's got an ability to fight into these rounds three, four, and five. He's got heart for days and is not going to quit. You're going to have to save him from himself. He's a fighter's fighter, man. So, Anthony Smith, salute to you, my friend. Nice way to cap off the evening. Unfortunately, we go back to Tony Gravely shitting in the pie. The things could have been worse all around. So, you know, we move forward. We move forward. Contender Series on Tuesday, so you can check that out over on CJ MMA. I got to really get a better, like, branding thing going. I'm kind of all over the place these days. But the main thing is the grind never continues. I do my best to not fail you guys. Unfortunately, this could have been a lot sweeter and a couple – a couple things made it not as sweet. So that's on me, not you. If you followed me, thanks. If not, you went a couple other directions. A lot of you guys uh, hit. I know people reached out to me as well. DK looked pretty good. A lot of finish on this card. So you got the right lineup. It was a good opportunity to hit. And a lot of people kept it simple, went with the uh, the options that they liked best, and were able to turn it in the green. If you were in the red because of a guy like Tony Gravely, I'm really sorry. And uh, hopefully we get the bounce going our way the next time. So we'll be back for UFC 266 next week huge card and we've got a couple of cool little announcements for that if you're following the whole racehorse thing uh think we're doing it. we're crushing it i mean i think there's like eight slots left maybe seven shares left but we will be gifting one share to a fan contest details will be given out on uh, tuesday's contender series shows over on cjmma and then of course dogger pass on wednesday and then i'm doing propping you up this week with man with lock of the night on thursday so tons of tons of opportunity to uh, to get in on the action but essentially to give you guys so you can start your homework now. Essentially, hit the PRP. And even if you don't hit the PRP, if you are the guy in the comment section of the tweet that goes out that has the most consecutive fights, you could go 11 for 12 on the card, but got five in a row, Tony Gravely screwed you, and you got the rest of the wrong, don't matter. You got five. You're hit, you got to hit them in a row, right? And if the highest guys got eight or nine or 10, it's that person can be gifted uh, one share of the racehorse, which is 500 US. And it's a one-time fee for the year. So you, it, it, it's a value of $500. And you're not going to have a bill. You're going to get 1% of the racehorse, share in 1% of his earnings, share in 1% of his resale value if we move him at the end of the season. Or or you can reinvest that 1% and race him another season, right? See how he goes. Got to see how things goes. We are definitely not buying the Tony Gravely of horses because what a heartbreaker that is, my God. Anyways, I'll leave you to it till the next time. Thank you to Mayo Media Network. As always, throw me up the platform. And thank you to DraftKings Sportsbook. Love the support and couldn't be doing it without you guys. So thanks to everybody for viewing as well. And uh, yeah, let's get it next time around. Take it easy. Oh, oh, oh. Oh.